start in Psalm chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1. And I just want you to put your thinking cap on this morning. I want you to think about a couple of things. One thing I want you to just imagine, you just woke up in the morning. Imagine it's morning time before you go off to work, you go off to school, or you just start your day. You know, a, a lot of people in here, a lot of people in here in this congregation, they start out their day in the Word. And they'll take the Bible out, and it, it's awesome. You read the Bible before you get started with your day. And a lot of people that do that, they make mention and they say things like, it just sets the tone for my day. It just gets me ready for the day. So they'll have like little different statements about it, but you can see that they see how much good it does them. And that is great whenever you just read, you just read the word before you get started. You know, um, one of the ways I read it when I first got started was my pastor told me one thing that's good for young men. And I was young then, I was 21. But he said that a long time ago, but it still works today. He said, you take the book of Proverbs. He said, there's 30, there's 30 chapters in the book of Proverbs. He said, when you wake up in the morning, read whatever day of the month it is, that chapter of Proverbs. And that's how I got started in reading the Bible. It was so helpful to me. The book of Proverbs is so, so, so helpful. It is really a helpful book in just get your day started. It's really the best one to me in get your day started. And when, but when you look and you start thinking about what you do to get your day started, there's also not just the aspect of reading and studying the Word, there's also the aspect of prayer. And I just have to say, like, you know, other people may love other things and other places for this, and the Bible is beautiful and great from cover to cover. But I just love the book of Psalms and get my heart ready to go to my prayer time and to take on my day. And one of the things the book of Psalms does, you know, a lot of the books in the Bible, they talk about historical facts, and sometimes they talk about prophecy. Sometimes they talk about, you know, how things should operate within the church. Sometimes they talk about different gifts people have, all kind of things that the Bible talks about. But here in the book of Psalms, the reason that I think it is so effective in, like, getting your mind and your heart in sync and ready for your prayer time is that you see the raw emotions of the writers. They are really just speaking to God and you can hear the words and you can see that you can hear the disappointment in their voice with how things are going sometimes. Sometimes you can feel the hurt and the pain of how they feel because of something somebody's done to them. Or sometimes you feel the fear or the worry they have because of something they're going to have to face. And so, you know, whenever you truly are praying to God and you're just talking to God and you're just being real with God, that's how you're going to be. That's how we go to bed sometimes, right? We can't sleep because we got stuff on our minds, stuff that's bothering us. That's how you wake up sometimes in the morning. You're dreading to start your day because you know what you want to face that day. Sometimes we're tired. Sometimes we're excited and we're happy. You see all those emotions in the book of Psalms. And so we're going to take really the first one, which is my favorite. It's like one I based my life off of. This is the life I want to live. But just give an introduction to Psalm today with the first chapter and the second chapter tonight. And when you look at this, I want you to think about when you read it. Like, just, just take a second and read this Psalm. There's only six verses in it. It don't take a second. But just read it like you got up in the morning. Just read it. Just imagine you just woke up. You're fixing to start your day. And this is the chapter you're reading as you start your day. And when you get done reading it, just stand up. And I'll pray for us when we get started. just going to read verse 6. For the Lord knoweth, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, 
Lord, we pray, God, that you bless us with just your word speaking to our heart today. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, when, when you talk about the Bible, when, when, you, when you've read it, like you just sat down literally just today, you were sitting down in a seat and you read a chapter of the Bible. This is what I, the question I ask about most of your days is do you hear it? Do you hear it? Like literally, do you hear it? Do you hear the word? Do you hear it? Do you, do you take the time to listen and to hear it? You see, you made a decision this morning. You made a decision this morning. And, and what this psalm does is it, it contrasts. It contrasts. It compares in some ways, but it also contrasts the godly and the ungodly. And so sometimes what we can do is we can just read it. You know, not really think about what it's saying, not really just kind of ponder on it, but we just read it. And, and don't get me wrong, that's better than nothing. But you really need to think about the word. You need to ponder on the word. That, that's kind of the thing that changes you. So do you hear it most days? Do you take the time to read the word of God and to think about the word of God? Do you hear it? The second question I ask is, does it hit you? You know, some people can actually read it and they can ponder on it, they can think about it, but then it never changes anything in the way they live. It doesn't affect them. You know, it's like, it's like, did you hear it? And did it hit you? Did it change you? You know, like your depth and your time that you're spending with God in preparation for prayer or for Bible study or for going through your day, you can know it is not enough if it isn't hitting you. It must hit you. It must change you. It must affect how you live the day you're fixing to go live. God will bring these verses back to mind as you go throughout that day. But you can look and you can see that today you made a choice, you know. There was other people that woke up this morning. And, you know, they may be members of this church actually on the road. Or may just be people that attend. But they aren't here. And you say, why aren't they here? Because they made a choice. And so they will never hear it. Oh, I get you can watch online and all that, but that is not the same. That is not the same. It is not the same. I think we learned, we learned anything in COVID, we learned that we need each other and we need to be physically in the presence of one another. And physically in a place where you, and don't get me wrong, if you work shift work, if you're out of town, and stuff like that, it's great because you can stay in touch and you get some, it ain't the same. But some people made a choice this morning to stay home. You made a choice to be here. And, and that's kind of what God is doing with this song. Is he just pointing out two people that chose. And, and really the interesting thing about Psalm 1 is it really only leaves two classes of people, two types of people, or two choices. The godly and the ungodly. So it's very simple in its nature. It's very simple. It's not something that's going to trip you up. It's something that is very simple, and you can understand when you get to the end of it, which path you're on. Listen to what it says. It says, blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. That, that word blessed is plural. It's the same way the Sermon on the Mount starts. You know, we've been preaching through the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday night. Blessed is the man. So many people want the blessings of God. But see, what God did is he described how that man walked and where that man went. The man he's going to bless. There's literally some denominations of some people who teach that you can just speak something and it'll be. We aren't in control. God is. God decides. Just because you think it or speak it does not make it be. 
I don't care if you put Jesus' name on it or not. God described the kind of man he's going to bless. The kind of woman he's going to bless. The kind of person he's going to bless. And look at how he described it. He said, blessed is the man that walketh not the counsel of the ungodly. First, we see the separation of their steps. We see God start drawing a line between the godly and the ungodly. And the first way that he does it is by their steps. He says this, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Walketh, this word is used metaphorically to speak of the path or behavior in someone's life. Remember what I said? Imagine you're starting off your day. Imagine you're fixing to go to your prayer time. If it's hitting you, you know what you'll do when you read this? You won't just read it and go on and live your day like normal. The thing that happens is you start praying, and I get into my prayer time. When I read this, and I, and I use this a lot, like I said, this is like my life chapter right here. This is the way I want to live. This is what helps me understand how I need to be. When you read this first part, you understand what it means. He walketh not in counsel the ungodly. It means he doesn't live in an unrighteous, unholy way. That's not his way of life. So if I'm really hearing the word and the word's hitting me in my prayer time, in my devotional time, then the prayer, I want one of the things I'm going to be praying about is God help me not to live in an ungodly way. And what the Holy Spirit does is when you're really listening to God is the Holy Spirit starts to reveal and, and open up in your mind and point out the things that need to change. God will start bringing instances in your mind. And you have to start praying over these things like, 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 God, forgive me because yesterday I said this. God, forgive me. Help me not to do that anymore. So there's a separation in their steps. When, when you think about in the council, he says, walketh not in the council of the ungodly. What does that word counsel mean? It means they're advice or example. You don't listen to the world. And you don't follow the world. That's not what you set out to do with your life in your day. And some people made a decision this morning. Some people have decided to follow the advice of the world. Some people are out doing things the world said will make them happy. And bring them joy. Some people are following the example of the world today. They're out doing things and following the example of the world. Trying to get the most they can get. Do the most they can do. Have the most they can have. Have all the pleasure they can have. Some people followed that example last night. And they're still asleep right now, right? And they're going to wake up hungover and hungry. Well, some of you might not have woke up hungry. I don't know how you woke up. I don't know how you look up. Advice or example. The godly refuses the ungodly advice and example. So you want to be blessed by God. You want to be, you know, see the blessings of God in you and your family's life. But how are you living your life? What is this thing that even in just a few moments, think about how, think about how just literally it's been minutes since we started, I started preaching. Think about how many things God's already run through your mind. How many ways you follow the world. How many things you do that are worldly. How many things that God is convicting you of already. Imagine if you've done this every morning. How your life would change. And you didn't just hear it, but you let it hit you. And you let it change you. How different would your life be? And see, what God is doing with this psalm, one of the most beautiful and great things about this psalm is it keeps you from fooling yourself. Because we can feel that we're godly and we're okay and we're doing good when we really aren't. And I've been there. You know, he said, you got to make a choice. He said the godly will not listen to the advice or follow the example of the ungodly. Just imagine there's a line, there's a separation in you. Just imagine there's some, there's a dividing line right here and you can't go in between. This is where some of you want to be in the middle. 
This is where most people are in church is in the middle. You know, you're not in the middle. Look at verse 6 again. The Lord knoweth the way to righteousness. See, sometimes it's very hard for us to see which ones in a congregation are listening to the advice of the world and really have hunger for worldly things in their heart. Sometimes it's hard for us to discern who those people are that are one way or the other way. Sometimes it's hard for us to discern for ourselves, especially when we get away from God and his word. But not for God. Listen to what God said in verse 6. God knows. God knows. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. So you don't need to say, well, I feel like you need to say, God, what do you say? Make a decision. Make a decision to walk like the God. Make a decision this morning to quit listening to the advice of the world and to follow the example of the world and become a godly person that God can bless. It's just six verses. Clearly this is six verses, but look what verse one goes on to say. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. You see it in their steps. You see it in their way they stand. The separation in their standing, where they stand. Listen, it says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. So he's not just repeating the same thing. He's talking about something a little different. Standeth it indicates living somewhere. Standing and remaining there, it means to continue. You can see a progression. You see that, that, that the first, that that man, that person, you know, it's like they're, they're not, they start listening to the advice of the world, following the example of the world, and then before long, you know what happens? Stand at the end of case, living somewhere. You're no longer just thinking about following them. You're no longer just starting to ease in that direction. You're full blown standing there. You're right in the midst of a worldly system. And living in a worldly way. Way, the word is used most often metaphorically to refer pathways of one line. Suggesting the pattern of life. So you're not far away if you're starting to listen to the advice of the world. And follow the example of the world. You're not far away if you listen to Psalm 1. From choosing a way of life and a pattern of life that is ungodly. But he says that godly people don't live there. That's not their pattern. He said that's the way of the ungodly. The path of the, of the ungodly. The pattern. Listen, what is the pattern in your life? I didn't ask you, did you walk down an aisle and say some words and get dunked in a pool? I ask you, what is the pattern of your life? Because it says the Lord knows in verse 6. And the Lord has given us some indicators in helping us to understand we are a godly person by saying what a godly person is not. See, he's using contrast. And he's saying what you're not. You wouldn't be someone that your pattern is to be worldly. And you cannot stand in the middle. You cannot stand in the middle. Now it becomes a lot clearer to us that you're an ungodly person, that you're a worldly person when your pattern is that way. When you start to live that way. There is less doubt in your mind of where you stand. The further you get along in this path. You're not just standing here making a decision to follow the advice anymore. You've done walked up there and got in the middle of it. And that's not just where you visit anymore. It is where you live. You understand? And what God says is, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You know one of the reasons you may not have joy in your life? You know one of the reasons you may not have peace in your life? The biggest reason may be 
that you're listening to ungodly advice and you're following the example of the word. You know why God may not be blessing you with peace and joy and using you? Because your pattern of life is ungodly. Your way of life is ungodly. Third thing he says in just one verse is nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The seat was like a place where someone important sat this word, this Hebrew word they use there, it's like a place where someone important sat or the teacher was. So now look at the progression. You went from being someone who made the decision to listen to godly, ungodly advice and worldly advice to living in that way to now you're teaching others. You're an expert in sin. You are the one drawing others in. You went from being the one taking the advice, ungodly advice, to being the one giving. And you would say that no one could ever do that and be in here on Sunday. But you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. See, everybody's not separated out now. But look, look at what verse 6 says. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Look at verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. One day the Lord, who knows in verse 6, is going to judge your life and if you are living ungodly not following him you are going to be separated out eternal you see the separation in their steps you see the separation in where they stand you see the separation in their seat in verse 1. But you see the separation in verse 5 and verse 6 and their eternity. And the Lord knows who you really are. And he decides the standard. And what that speaks of in verse 5 shall not stand in the judgment is speaking of like a courtroom setting and you will be judged and you will not meet the standard that God has set. And the standard that God has set has nothing to do with how you feel about it or what you think. And listen, when he separates them, he says it's like chaff which the wind driveth away. That is the useless hug on wheat that is worth nothing. And see, you feel the gravity of verse 5 and 6 in that moment. But what you don't understand is God's looking down knowing right now. He knows who you are. He knows who you are. That is my fear. For me and everybody in this room. Listen to me. When, when you don't take time to hear the word and you don't let the word hit you, you are in so much danger. You are in so much danger. And you say to me, you say, well, well Brother Greg, I hear people say this. If, if I was to speak to people about this, a lot of times what people say, well, I know I'm saved. It's, it's like they don't deny the way they're living is ungodly and wrong. But they say I'm saved. Well, they could be. 
I don't know. But you know, Lot, Lot made it to heaven. But his wife was destroyed. His two daughters ended up pregnant by him. He ended up a drunk and committed incest with his own daughters. You know, that's probably what Lot said. Well, I'm saved. If you look at Lot's life and you think about Lot's life, it's, it's probably not different, any different. I mean, you really see the same progression, don't you? He looked out. He was standing there, and Abraham and him, they had left together. He lived under Abraham. Abraham had been a blessing to him. But they just, their families got too big, and they were going to have to separate out. And make, he's going to have to go make his own home, so to speak. His own life. You know what Lot said? Abraham said, look out in anything, any place you want, you can have, and I'll take you up. You know what Lot did? He looked, and he seen how good Sodom looked. Because he was a farmer. You know, he was a herder. It looked so good to his eyes. It looked like easy living. It looked like a fun place to be. And so the first thing he did is he pitched his, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. You know what that means? He just was outside the city, but, you know, he was over there close, close enough to it he could watch it. Before you know it, you know what you find whenever you look longer into the story? He was living there. He started out just pitching his tent towards Sodom. Started out just looking out. And with, you know, human eyes and the flesh, you look at that and you think, that's where I should be. It looks easy. So he, he's found in the city later on in the account of it. And then before you know it, so he's at the gate. You say, what, what does that mean? Well, he was a high official, maybe even the mayor of the wickedest city on earth and had confronted none of them about their sin. And then God came one day talking to Abraham and he said, I'm fixing to destroy that place. You know why God destroyed that place? Because he said it stunk to him what they were doing. You know how much the people of Sodom were worried about it? Not one bit. You know how much warning they had? Basically none. And they were all destroyed and died. You know why? Because they were ungodly. They were ungodly. Listen, they listened to the advice of the world and followed the example of the world. Secondly, secondly, they went to live in that way on a consistent basis. And thirdly, they were just as much a part of it as anybody there. <clears throat> now you think about if you sat down in the morning and you just didn't read the Bible you thought about what the Bible said. Would not your day be different after hearing this this morning? Would you not live differently? Would you think a little harder about telling that dirty joke? Would you think a little bit harder about who you hung around with at work? Would you live differently? Now listen to me. You can, you can sit and be convicted like you are if you're being convicted right now. And what the Bible says is that in the parable of the sower and the seed that the time 
seed is planted. The time the word is preached, the devil's going to come and try to distract you. He's going to try to take your mind off of what you just heard. What's just been implanted in your mind and your heart. That's one of the ways he goes about it. So you need to, you need to just come right now when the invitation is given. I'm telling you right now, you need to make a choice. And every one of you, before you leave today, is going to make a choice. And your future is going to be decided in a moment. Now you, 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 you could have talked a lot when him and Abraham were splitting up. And you could have asked him the day after he left Abraham and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And you could have said, what was the biggest decision you ever made? And he probably would have said, man, leave her and come with Abraham. He probably didn't even know that the biggest decision he made, he just made it. He was probably eating lunch the next day. He was probably chilling. He was probably eating them biscuits some of you are thinking about right now. Thinking about where he's going on vacation, doing his thing. When he had made the biggest decision he ever made in his life, that he'd go and pinch his tent towards Sodom. That one day his whole life would be destroyed because of that one decision he made. And see, the thing about it is sometimes we do these things by commission. In other words, you'll see somebody leave here and they'll go live just as ungodly as they can be. And you say, yep, that old boy made his decision. God knew. But the one you don't see is the one that does it by the mission. He sits here in his service. And she he sits here in his service. And they know, listen to me, they know they should come and they should make that decision and they should change their life. And get off of the path of the ungodly and get on the path of the God. But they just didn't do it. Or they didn't go out there and commit a bunch of sins you could see with your eyes. But they just omitted following God. Now see, there's one more thing that God shows us. He shows us what they don't do. But then in verse 2, he shows us what they do. Too. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in the season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What a big contrast, verse 3 is, with how you feel if you're being convicted about living ungodly. Imagine how the people in here that are living godly feel when they read chapter 1 of Psalms. And they're following God, and they're in the Word of God, and they're trying to live the Word of God. And they crave the word of God. They see in here that he planted like a tree by the rivers of water. And his leaf shall not wither. God will bless you in life and God will bless you in eternity. But one of the marks of the godly person is they have a desire for the word of God. Now he uses that word delight. I love that word delight. You know what it makes me think of? Chocolate delight. No, I'm being serious. That little crust when they cook it just right. You know what I mean? Like, I think about chocolate delight. You know what I think about when I think about that? I think about something that it, it's just like that sin, right? You say, well, how do I walk past the temptation of sin in the world? How do I, how do I get past that temptation? You walk past that temptation because you're on the way to something you enjoy better that you want more. I just want to tell you something. You know, maybe if you're new to church, I just want to give you some great advice. Like when we eat at a potato bar or when we eat like a potluck supper, which is just everybody brings something and they have desserts. If there is a dessert you really want, you know what the best thing you can do is? Come on. Some, eat, some, it first. eat it first. See Florida say it? Eat it first, right? If there's something, if there's something I delight in, if there's something I delight in, 
Yeah, I'm just telling you, it could be the best looking chicken sitting there. It could be the best looking dumplings. It could be the best looking whatever. Now, green beans never really look good to me. I just don't like green stuff. If they just had a pill I could take for green stuff, I'd just take a pill. I love carbs and meat. That's just me. Amen. Amen. But, but I'm telling you, you, when you've got that certain dessert on your mind, and listen, you know it's there. You can walk past all those other things that are tempting you. You may be hungry as you can be, but you walk past them. Why happen you walk past them? Because you're going to something you love even more. Something you don't want to miss. Something that, that listen, if you, if you missed all the other things that day, that are sitting on that table that day, you would be okay when you got home. But if you walk by that dessert and you didn't get a piece then, and you come back later, you're going to be disappointed in yourself because you didn't take the opportunity to get the thing you delighted in most that you love the most. Now, some of you have a problem when I talk about it because you don't delight in the law of the Lord. Now, listen to me. If you don't delight in the law of the Lord, first thing you need to do is make sure you're saved. Second thing you need to do is make sure you're not in sin. These things kill your appetite for God and His Word. Third thing you need to do if those two things are in place is pray for the desire. You think I wake up every morning feeling like that? You seriously, I've got to preach. I've got to preach three and sometimes five times in a week. You think I wake up every morning? Like sometimes I wake up feeling just like you. You know what I do? I say, God help me. God help me to have a desire. You don't think there's periods of my life when I struggle with the same things you do? That's why I'm thankful God called me to preach. I don't have a lot of choice in the matter. You understand? And it helps me to stay straight. But you have to pray for that desire. You have to pray for it. If you're missing it today, it is the secret ingredient you don't have. Because if you can get a desire for the word of God and you can get a taste for the word of God, I'm telling you right now, all of everything else will fall into place. And when you wake up in the morning and you hear the word, you make time for the word and you let the word hit you. You can walk right past those things because you know there's something better. And so that may be what you need to pray for today. I don't know. But I'm telling you today, you've got to make a choice. And which way are you going to choose? You say, well, I'm not going to make a choice. If you don't make a choice, you made the choice to live ungodly. But I know there's a lot of people who have made a choice to live godly. And they know just what that tree feels like. They aren't dry and empty and dead on the inside like you are. They're planted by the river. And they're just like what John 7 said that Jesus said, the river, the river of life actually, it flows from their heart. Oh, they used to be the ones who walked with the ungodly. They used to be the ones to stand in the midst of the ungodly. Hey, they might even used to be the ones that were teaching people to live ungodly. But now they are walking in a godly lifestyle and living for Christ. And they are prospering. And you say, Brother Greg, you say in verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Are you telling me today he'll bless me with a pile of money? No, no, no. I'm not talking about that kind of blessing. He takes care of his own, but what I'm talking about is when you are in the will of God, he will help you to produce the things he wants done in this life. He will bless you and carry it out the desire of your heart because when your heart's right, you desire to please him. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man that walketh not the counsel of the ungodly. Lord, I pray with all my heart this morning that every person in this room today 
that have heard the word. Lord, they would heed the word. I know that this psalm right here, this one thing, has made the greatest difference in my life. Living now with the end in mind. Lord, they've heard enough from this psalm this morning to know what the end of their road looks like. And I pray this morning, God, that they leave that ungodly lifestyle they're living, they're living that way. And they come and they follow you today. God, help them do that. If all the people that are walking godly today, they'd probably be like me reading these words as I studied them this week. They just think, as I, I just sat there and tears start welling up from my eyes. Knowing that I don't have to live the way I used to live anymore. 